بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم مائی نیم از سائرہ رمضان آئی ایم لیکچر ان ڈپارٹمنٹ آف آرکیالوجی یونیورسٹی آف دی پنجاب مائی پریزنٹیشن از اباؤٹ مائی ایمفل تھیسز اینڈ ٹائٹلڈ ایز مریم زمانی ماسک ہسٹری اینڈ آرکیٹیکچر اینڈ اینالیٹیکل اسٹڈی آئی ڈٹ مائی ایمفل فرام ڈپارٹمنٹ آف آرکیالوجی یونیورسٹی آف پشاور مائی تھیسز از سپروائزڈ بائی مائی موسٹ ریسپیکٹیبل ٹیچر گریٹ ہیومن بینگ پروفیسر ڈاکٹر نعیم قاضی Dean of Arts and Humanities, Peshawar University. First of all, I will describe the contents of my thesis. Declaration, Acknowledgement, List of Illustrations, Introduction, Historical Background, Tradition of Mosque Building in Lahore, Marim Swani Mosque, Its History, The Founder of the Mosque, The Mosque Architecture, Plan, Entrance, courtyard, tank for ablution, roof and dome, prayer chamber, mihrab, the shard of the mosque or evan, four centered arch, pavilions, decoration and ornamentation of Marim Zmani Mosque, calligraphy, fresco paintings, conservation of Marim Zmani Mosque, the origin of fresco paintings in the province of Punjab, impact of the architecture of Marim Zmani Mosque on the subsequent period, Penkruyan, and bibliography. Aims and Objectives This thesis aims to explore the architectural difference of Prim Zmani Mosque with other mosques in Lahore. This research work aims to highlight influence of Prim Zmani Mosque on architecture in the subsequent period. This thesis aims to examine different streams of influences on the fresco paintings, calligraphy, geometrical and floral designs, and architectural elements including domes, Peshad and Mindrut of the Marim Zmani Mosque. I will also try to explore the preservation status of this mosque in the colonial and post-colonial periods. Methodology I employ the qualitative and quantitative research methods for this research. Qualitative research method is based on data collection and data analysis. My data collection includes the group discussions, observation and field notes, maps, building plans, various stats, archival pictures and other materials. Data analysis is the next step of my research methodology. This includes literature review, descriptive research method and analytical research method for the analysis of all data collection regarding to my research work. Significance. This work will be helpful for the academic circle and for the students of archaeology and history as well as for those who are working on religion and religious monuments in various perspectives. Historical Background Masjid or mosque has been regarded as pivotal in the formation of Islamic styles of architecture. As is well known, at Medina, Rasulullah purchased a piece of land and laid the foundation of a mosque. It is difficult now to have a precise idea of its architecture, though it had traditional pattern, prayer chamber or sanctuary towards south and courtyard and eastern side all the mosques in the world are built on the same pattern. As far as the history of mosque architecture in subcontinent regarding Pakistan is concerned, the earliest mosque known to have been erected on the soil of Pakistan was at Debal, the famous seaport in the neighborhood of the modern hamlet of Mbhor, some 40 miles north of Karachi. As far as the beginning of mosque architecture in Lahore is concerned, it has been asserted that Mahmud of Ghazna erected a mosque at Lahore which was called Khishti Mosque or Khishti Masjid. Ravages of time did not leave this mosque intact. The brick construction of this mosque must have followed Central Asian traditions. The celebrated Usman Ali Hijweri, better known as Tata Ganj Paksh, is also credited to have erected a mosque at Lahore near his hermitage. No trace of mosque exists now. It can only be survived that the existing modern mosque adjacent to his tomb is the modified and renovated version of the old erection. With the in inauguration of the Mughal Empire in the subcontinent through the early decades of the 16th century, mosque architecture received a new dimension, a height of perfection and enrichment. 
Although um, the earlier examples portray a kind of continuation of the previous style, but the mature phase has a personality of its own, a happy blending and natural assimilation of Iranian and local traditions of art and crafts. It has been reported by the contemporary as well as later historians that Babur and Hamayun built mosques at the places of their political influence. However, no mosque of this period is known to exist in the areas which are now Pakistan. Upper the great emperor ascended the throne in 1556 AD. At Lahore, a small massive mosque is situated in Lahori Gate, which has been attributed to the days of Akbar and is said to have been erected by Sayyid Najaf Ali Khan, a petty officer of Lahore. The brick-built mosque is faced with thick lime plaster. The oblong prayer chamber has three compartments surmounted with low domes. This was the first mosque of any Mughal em emperor built in Lahore. According to the statement made by Mullah Abdul Qadir Badami, Akbar built a Sufa or Masjid in the Lahore fort. It doesn't exist now. A ruined mosque located in the neighborhood of the Bauli at Jandiala Sher Khan in Shekhupura district. Jahangir was not a very enthusiastic builder, though a few mosques of his days exist in Pakistan of particular interest is the mosque erected at Lahore under the patronage of his mother is known as Maryam Zamani or Begum Shahi Mosque. This is one of the most ancient mosques of the city. It is situated close to the Masti gate of the city opposite to the eastern walls of the fort. As inscription on the northern gateway shows, it was built in 1023 AH or 1614 AD during the reign of Jahangir by his mother, Maryam Zamani. Maryam Zamani Mosque or Begum Shahi Mosque was the first great mosque in Lahore which set a precedent of mosque building and also gave a pattern of mosque building in Lahore. The architecture of this mosque has a great impact on the subsequent period. Wazir Khan Mosque which was built after two decades of Maryam Zamani Mosque has a great resemblance with this mosque. It can be said that the Wazir Khan Mosque is actually a refined and advanced form of Maryam Zamani Mosque. History of the Maryam Zamani Mosque As given in the description on the mosque was built by Maryam Zamani, mother of Emperor Jahangir, in 1023 age or 1614 AD, this date is derived from the text Hush Masjidi inscribed on the eastern gate. According to an query, she was the daughter of Raja Bihari Mal and sister of Raja Bhagwan Das. Before the building of Wazir Khan Mosque, this mosque seems to serve as the Jamia Mosque of the city. The royal members are related to say their prayers in this mosque while they were staying in the Lahore fort. Besides, the mosque had been used for the purpose by the nobility as well as the common people. However, during the Sikh period, the mosque was banned for prayers and it was misused by converting it into a gunpowder magazine. The gunpowder factory had been running here by a full-fledged staff under the supervision of Jawahar Mal Mistri. However, in 1850, the mosque was vacated by throwing into the river Ravi the gun magazine powder stored in it. Afterwards, the mosque was registered as Nazul land by Fakuddin, the Drogai Nazul, but later on Major McGregor, then Deputy Commissioner of Lahore, returned the mosque to the Muslims of Lahore along with the shops and houses allotted to it. At the time of its transfer, the mosque was in poor condition of preservation. The local Muslim carried out its special repairs with the funds raised by themselves. In 1962-63, the mosque was declared protected by government of Pakistan. This brick structure is celebrated for two very important features, the double domes with which the prayer chamber is crowned and the exquisite fresco painting of the interior surface. You can see the inscription of the date of the Begum Shahi or Maryam Zamani Mosque. The founder, the founder Maryam Zamani, at whose instance the mosque was constructed, very little is known. She was a Rajput princess of the Kachwaha clan and the eldest daughter of Raja Baharimal, ruler of Ambar. 
Even her real name is not mentioned by any contemporary or later historian. Abul Fazl, the principal biographer of Akbar, records the circumstances which led to this matrimonial alliance. He says that Akbar married the daughter of Raja Bahari Mal in nine. In 968 AH or 1560 AD, at the latter's instance, at a place named Samwar near the modern town of Jaipur in India. He does not record the exact date of the marriage but says that the ceremony was held on his return from the visit to the celebrated saint Sheikh Salim Chishti in Jamadil Awal. 968 AH or January 1561 AD. The event must have therefore occurred in the first half of February 1561 AD. The Rajput queen gave birth to a child after more than seven years on 17th Rabil Awal 977 AH or 30th August 1569 AD who was destined to become the successor of Akbar under the title of Jahangir. Abul Fazl gives a detailed account of this auspicious occasion. As usual with the ladies of the royal harem, only indirect and scanty references are available in the contemporary as well as later authorities, which give glimpses into the events connected with the life of Mariam Zamani. The best source of our information in this connection is the biography of her own son, Jahangir, who mentions her more than once. Each time he writes about her with respect and reverence. A close study of these notes reveals that the Queen Mother had a very high position in the imperial household. Almost all the important events of the family used to take place at her palace. Jahangir recalls that twice he was uh, ceremoniously wait on his birth day at the house of Mariam Zamani. The marriage feast of Prince Parvez was performed at her house. Even his own marriage with the daughter of Raja Man Singh was performed in her house. The reverence the emperor had for his mother may be estimated from the following note in his memories. On Friday, the 12th of the month, mentioned Rabbi Lahir, I embarked in a boat and one and went to a village named Dahar to meet my mother, and I had the good fortune to be received by her. After the performance of obeisance and prostration and greeting which is due from the young to the old, according to the custom of Genghis Khan, the rules of the mood and common usage, and after worship of the uh, king of the world, gold, and after finishing this business, I obtained leave to return and re-entered the fort of Lahore. Similar sentiments were expressed by the emperor when he met her in Kashmir. He says, Oh, the same day, Her Majesty, the Reverend Mariam Zamani, his mother, came from Agra, and I acquired eternal good fortune from the blessings of waiting on her. I hope that the shadow of her bringing up and affection may be perennial on the head of his of this suppliant. After enjoying the respect of and influence over two great Mughal emperors for more than 60 years, the Queen Mother died on the 19th Rajab, 1032. A.H. on 9th May 1623 A.D. at Agra. Jangi records in his memories, On this day, 19th Rajab, 1032 A.H., news came from Agra that Her Highness Marie Muzamani, by the decree of God, had died. I trust that Almighty God will envelop her in the ocean of His mercy. The Queen Mother was buried at Sikandra, Agra at a supplanted tomb was erected over the grave by Jahangir. During the long period of authority which he enjoyed, Mariam Zamani erected a number of monumental buildings at many places of the Mughal Empire. Some of these buildings still exist which remind us of the glorious days they once enjoyed. Her own palace at Fatipur Sikri, the mosque at Lahore, and a grand building constructed at a cost of rupees uh, 20,000, according to T.W. Bale, who recorded in 1873 AD, the garden had then uh, disappeared, but the bowling still existed. It was built in the seventh year of the accession of Jahangir. 
with red sandstone and had a Persian inscription carved on a marble slab and fixed over the facade. The mosque architecture plan. The mosque is, rectangu is rectangular on plan and covers an area of land measuring 135 feet or 6 inches by 127, uh, 127 feet and 6 inches constructed of brick masonry and finished with lime plaster. It is a massive structure of impressive building. This mosque was built on traditional pattern having prayer chamber on western side and courtyard on eastern side. Entrance This mosque has two arched gateways, one on, one on the east. Both gateways are provided with inscriptions. The Persian inscription within arched panel fixed on the eastern gateway reads, May the conqueror of the world, Emperor Nuruddin Muhammad, shine in the world like the sun and moon, O Allah. The Persian inscription executed over the central arched panel fixed on the northern gateway reads, Allah is the greatest. Allah is to be thanked through whose grace under the auspices of Her Majesty this building was completed. The founder of this edifice, the, the place of salvation, is the Queen Maryam Zamani. For the date of the completion of this edifice, which resembles the paradise, I was pondering when finally I found it in the words, what a fine mosque. The inscription records the date of the completion of the edifice in the chronogram. It is derived from the word Hush Masjidi. Hush Masjidi, what a fine mosque. Courtyard. On eastern side, there is a courtyard or sehin. A flight of four steps in each gateway leads downward to the main courtyard, measuring 123 feet by 83 feet. The courtyard was originally enclosed by rows of cells on its north and south, some portions of which still exist. A modern roof of reinforced cement concrete RCC spotted by two rows of round pillars covers the tank partially on its four sides. The courtyard must have been paved with brick tiles in usual Mughal fashion, but it has now been completely relayed in modern brick. At the northwest and the southwest corners beside the prayer chamber are located the old staircases leading to the roof. Similarly, on the northeastern and southeastern corners were staircases leading to the roof of the cells. Only their traces are left now. On the cast along the gate is a 17 feet wide platform on which stands an enclosure consisting of an octagonal tomb, tomb of Ghulam Qadir Bhairvi and some other modern graves. You can see the courtyard here. This is the facade of the mosque and uh, the uh, green color shows the tank for ablution. Tank for ablutions. In the center of the courtyard renovated a modern row of reinforced cement concrete arses supported by two rows of round pillars covers the tank partially on its four sides. The courtyard must have been paved with brick on edge in the usual Mughal fashion, but it has now been completely relayed in modern bricks. At the northwest and the southwest corners beside the prayer chamber are located the old staircases leading to the roof of the cells. Now only the traces are seen. Roof and Dome the each compartment of the prayer chamber was roofed with dome. This is also a new feature that is each compartment or each bay is roofed by a dome. The central compartment or dome invites special attention because it is double dome in its appearance. So it was a device which first time introduced in Pakistan in Jahangir's period. So far its origin is concerned, it was the influence of Iranian architecture. After that, double dome became very important and a prominent feature of Muslim architecture, especially in the mosque architecture. This is generally believed that these two shells were applied to achieve the required height of the dome. Although the high domes were already built in Tughlaq period, but their height were achieved by applying more squinches as we have seen in the Shah Rukhni Alam tomb. Both shells had their independent support, that is squinches. 
if we say internally the height of the dome seems low whereas when we say externally the height of the dome seems higher so it is also believed that technically this device provided more durability and beauty to the dome architecture each compartment is interlinked by lateral arches which occupies the western half of the original plan of the mosque the central double dome is the highest placed on a high and round neck while side ones had low dome the double domes consists of two shells the outer and the inner shell is of stucco a wooden framing connects the two shells for reinforcement the outer shell has a small arched opening on the west these are the double domes of the maryam samani mosque prayer chamber and mihrab the prayer chamber of the mosque however is of special interest architecturally it is an oblong structure measuring internally 130 feet or 6 inches from south to north and 34 feet from east to west it is a rectangular single aisle prayer chamber which occupies the western half of the original plan of the mosque it has five compartments divided by heavy engaged arches spotted by massive jambs and surmounted by high domes inside the prayer chamber there is a series of high and deep arch recesses set in all the five compartments on the west the central niche the mihrab has an engraved arch treated specially with profuse stucco ornamentation both geometric floral and inscriptional the half domed niche of the central arch opening and the mihrab has also been filled with low stalactites the remaining four compartments have the same engraved arch treatment though comparatively smaller and less decorated It has been argued that the hypostyle zulla has been originally inspired from the apadana of the Persepolis and the hypostyle chambers of Egypt. Whatever the origin and influence, the hypostyle zullas in the shape of flat roofed porticos have been very much uh, favored not only in its initial stage but at later times as well. It has been adopted as a matter of preference in several instances at many places in Pakistan, leaving aside the examples which were mainly adaptations of the earlier buildings, the Hindu temples. The hypostyle zullas are frequently met with, for instance, at the historic ancient cities of Multan and Uj, especially during the 14th and 15th centuries. The mosques attached to the hypostyle tombs of Jalaluddin Bukhari and Jahaniya Jangasht have the zullas with with flat roof here the flat roof has been supported by a series of wooden posts arranged in several regular rows the wooden posts in fact take the shape of a formal column consisting of the base the shaft and the capital on which the entablatures are placed to hold the wooden frames of the roof which itself is composed of wooden planks and brick tiles these wooden elements are tastefully painted with a variety of floral designs in red and yellow colors as far as the ewan of maryam zamani mosque is concerned the front, front openings of the chambers five in number possesses four centered arch the the central one being the highest and the biggest than the flanks with a high parapet and a projected frame the whole outer surface of the front has been treated with thick lime plaster creating decorative arch panels in recess four centered arch the most important thing which first time appear in muslim architecture of pakistan on the whole and particularly in maryam zamani mosque is the four centered arch in its full fleshed form we may say that this is first appearance of four centered arch in pakistan you can see the elevation of the maryam zamani mosque this is the fashad the front elevation The inscriptions on the entrance gates are in Astali characters and that on the facade of prayer chamber in Nasr Sulz. Among the Quranic inscriptions, the most prominent is on the mihrab of the mosque. The Tughra gives the usual Aitul Kursi, while at the crown of the arch niche is the Kalma. 
Similarly, all the fissures of the niches in other compartments have been decorated with inscriptions of verses from the Quran. There is only one saying of the Rasul Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, peace be upon him, painted on the fissure of the second left arch. Fresco painting, like fine mosaic revetment. Fresco painting has also been a very favorite medium of surface ornamentation with which interior of these houses of prayers has been adorned. The use of this medium, it may be reiterated, has a history of its own in this subcontinent going back to, going back to the early centuries of the Christian era. The early examples at the Jogi Mara Caves in Mirzapur district in India and those more celebrated at Ajanta and Bagh take us deep into antiquity. The tradition has since continued and during the Mughal rule we find it applied extensively. The fabulous buildings erected by Akbar and his successors at Agra, Lahore, Fatehpur Sikri and Delhi possesses some ex exquisite uh, examples of this type of decoration. The mosque, however, stands out uniquely for its fresco decoration with which the whole of the interior surface of the prayer chamber is replete. The paintings have been rightly decorated as unrivaled in Pakistan and perhaps in India for their delicacy and lively variety. The fresco painting at the mosque of Manim Zamani are the first of its kind and provide evidence for its earliest non-use in the mosque of Pakistan. Never in the history of the architecture of the early Mughal period do we find such extensive and ex exclusive use of this type of decoration. The endless variety of geometric, floral and inscriptional designs spread over the interior surface in a subtle color scheme is a characteristic not seen elsewhere. The surface has been divided into various panels of different shapes and dimensions according to the space available and all the soffits, niches, quinches, arches, interior of the domes, apex are covered with these paintings. The squinches have been provided with low stalactites painted with small flower twigs while the adjoining areas are divided into arch panels which have bold interwoven floral patterns. Some of the borders of the panels have geometric schemes of decoration created by carving slightly incised leans in white. The interior of the dome has similarly been divided into honeycomb geometric patterns filled with delicate floral tracery. The small space in between is filled elegantly with stars which bear some of the attributes of Allah done in Nas characters. The superb combination of colors is also noteworthy. Almost all shades of green, red, blue, yellow and black have been used for the purpose without giving the whole scheme an obtrusive effect. The experience and proficiency achieved in this masterpiece of Jahangir's early period was used extensively later on in several other buildings. The Mosque of Azir Khan at Lahore is the most auspicious example of this type of ornamentation. The tradition so set up by this grand Mughal mosque was followed rather universally. The Muhabbat Khan Mosque at Peshawar, the Wazir Khan Mosque, the Achinyawali Masjid and Masjid Saleh Kambo, both at Lahore and many others of the series still retain such ornamentation while those created during the early decades of the present century have been mainly decorated in a simpler technique called seco where the elaborated methods of uh, real fresco were not followed the technique used in the mosques at multan och muzaffargarh and elsewhere was just color painting on chuna glazed plaster this is generally called multani painting Conservation of Parim Zamani Mosque The overall condition of its preservation is unsatisfactory due to raising of the surrounding ground level. The mosque is being affected badly by the dampness. With the passage of time, the painting itself has been damaged by the natural calamities and the neglect by the responsible persons. 
additions and alterations made in the building structure for provision of electricity arrangement have also damaged the decoration of mosque the inscription on the entrance door have also been badly deteriorated the writing in the ceiling had also been damaged seriously repairs to the mosque the mosque remained frequented by the mughal nobility and the common man alike for prayer for more than 200 years when the sikh ruler and jeet singh changed its religious character by converting it into a powder magazine the muslims were therefore denied entry into the premises to offer prayer the gunpowder factory established in the mosque had a full-fledged staff working under the superintendence of jawahar mal mistri however in 1850 a.d major mcgregor then deputy commissioner of lahore restored the most to the muslims along with the shops and houses attached to it at the time of the transfer the condition of the mosque was deplorable and required immature repair which was carried out by the subscriptions contributed by local muslims unfortunately we are not aware of the details of these repairs but it may be assumed that the whitewash concealing the frescoes here and there in the interior of the prayer chamber the repaving of the courtyard with modern bricks and other extensive repairs to the ablution tank and to the eastern gateway are some of these repairs though not according to archaeological principles these and the later repairs nevertheless strengthened the structure of the mosque later on the mosque was provided with electricity and elaborate arrangements were carried out for electric fittings restoration of fresco painting after more than a century some enlightened members of the anjumane hanfiya kadriya the organization responsible for the maintenance of the mosque considered the desirably desirability of re renovating the fresco work which had undergone decay and defacement and at places was concealed under layers of whitewash the organization raised a fund of rupees 50000 for the purpose through subscriptions and donations it was fortunate that the committee approached the de uh, department of archaeology for the execution of the work and the department accepted responsibility for technical assistance and advice no contribution was however made by the government as the monument was not at that time protected under the ancient monuments preservation act of 1904 the work of the restoration was started in 1959 under the supervision of the west pakistan circle of the department of archaeology for the purpose the monument was studied by the staff of the circle and both the structure as well as the fresco decoration were examined in order to prepare a detailed conservation note and estimate during the process of this examination it was found that the deterioration of the decoration was not entirely due to human neglect and uh, thoughtless repair it was to a great extent due to injurious climatic condition due to the passage of time the structure of the domes and ceiling covered with lime plaster had developed minute cracks which caused percolation of rain water and dampness in the plaster it was therefore necessary to fill up the cracks and other joints so that the percolation of water into the core of masari could be stopped the next task was a thorough study of the fresco paintings the deterioration was found to such an extent that to revive the past glory of the mosque the work has to be restored at many places at many places the frescoes were found hidden beneath the layers of lime wash while at other places sign of deterioration due to unfavorable weather were noticed the whole task was therefore divided into the following items a Detraining of cracks in the structure, B. Peeling of the layers of whitewash of fresco decoration, C. Removing the unsightly and damaging electric fittings, D. Tracing the decorative designs on papers, E. Retouching the less affected frescoes, F. Restoring the highly deteriorated sections. At the outset, it was realized that the tradition of fresco painting according to the traditional process had been almost forgotten and craftsmen employed for the job were first entrusted with preparing the tracing of all the designs and motifs drawn on the surface of the prayer chamber. The tracings were used after perforation to draw designs on the freshly prepared base for restoration. 
In 1962-63, the mosque was declared protected by the government of Pakistan. It was then decided to make an annual provision of Rs. 10,000 for the continuation of the work. Since then, restoration of the frescoes on the central and the other two bays has been completed. However, there is still much work to be completed to enliven the past glory of the mosque. These pictures are the uh, uh, conservation process pictures. And these are the traces of the fresco paintings which were made on the paper. Conclusion This dissertation is a general survey of the mosque and their architectural features and characteristics evolved and developed in Lahore regarding to a specific mosque named as Marim Zamani Mosque built by the mother of Emperor Jangi. This dissertation proves that Mariam Zwani Mosque was the first mosque of its kind in Lahore, which has great impact on the subsequent period. Mariam Zwani Mosque can be defined as a wonderful piece of art and architecture, although this mosque follows the traditional pattern of Islamic mosque, but technically as well as architecturally, it shows great turbulence in the art of architecture as well as in the form of mosque. When we talk about the source of inspiration of Marim Zwani Mosque, then it can be said that this is the mixture of Islamic and native architecture. Many features like pavilion was first time introduced in Marim Zwani Mosque. It can be said that it was the origin of Minrit in the Mosque of Lahore, which appeared in its full form in Wazir Khan Mosque. Wazir Khan Mosque was the mosque where Minrits were built with unique architectural techniques, which shows its glory. The concept and, and idea of double dome was also provided by Marim Zwani Mosque, which was also followed by the later period and its evidence is Wazir Khan Mosque. The extensive use of fresco paintings in the interior of the prayer chamber of Marim Zwani Mosque is remarkable. This happened first time that fresco painting was used in a mosque in Lahore. The history of the use of the fresco painting in Punjab is not clear, but a few examples are found particularly in the Indus Valley Civilization particularly at Hadapa murals, are found possible in fresco. The use of fresco painting in the uh, Vishnu temples of the Punjab hills in India is recorded in the history of the Indian arts. This shows that fresco is also a native tradition which was applied in the mosque architecture of Pakistan, especially Lahore in the reign of Jangi. We can divide the Mughal architecture into two phases. First phase in which the red sandstone was used in building the Mughal monuments from Hamayun to Akbar's reign and the second phase is the use of marble on a large extent in building for the purpose of decoration. As far as the decoration on Mughal monuments in Lahore is concerned, we see the tile mosaic work in Lahore fort on a large extent and fresco paintings in Mariam Zmani Mosque. Mariam Zmani Mosque became the trendsetter for the mosques in later period. We can say that Marim Zwani Mosque was in an experimental stage and Wazir Khan Mosque is its developed and advanced form. In the end, it can be concluded that Marim Zwani Mosque was the first mosque of its tradition and has great influence of the mosque architecture of the subsequent period. In the end, I am really grateful to my respected teacher, Professor Dr. Naim Kazi, to give me an opportunity and also providing me a platform to present my research work. Thank you, all of you. Thanks.